Daniel chapter 6. Daniel 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might have account unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could not find none, okay, they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask any petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree, and sign the writing that it be not changed, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open, and his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. And the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace, and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning, and went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice, unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. And the king, then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. 
Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth. And he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. What I'm talking about today is there in verse 10 where it says, as he did aforetime. As he did aforetime. Now if you look there in verse 1, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. Now, as far as government goes, this is what we're familiar with now. We will have a president, or we will have a prime minister, and then he will have princes that rule beneath him. And in this case, we even see it quite often where, verse 2, it says, and over these three presidents. So the structure was this, 120 princes, which are led by three princes, which has Darius over all of them. He had tiered his government and set it up to be so. Now this is pretty standard in most governments, but there's one thing that's a little bit different about this one we don't see too often, was that Daniel, a man like Daniel, was made first. And why was he made first? Continue reading. Verse 3, it says, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because, here's your answer, an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So the king even thought that he would set up his tiered government such that it would be King Daniel, the two heads over those princes, and then the princes underneath. A Christian, a believer, a follower of the God of Israel, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, second in command in a great government, a world government. That's where it's a little strange and a little bit different of a story. But it's not so strange when you see the reason. An excellent spirit was found in him. The spirit of God was found in him. And therefore, I believe the spirit of God was the one that set him to be so. He showed himself through allowing that spirit to work through him to be, as it says in verse 4, they could not find fault or occasion in him. Why? At the end it says, for as much as he was faithful, Neither was there any error or fault found in him. And this wasn't in regard to his Christianity or his faith or his, his following after the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. But actually, first they thought to find occasion with him concerning the kingdom. They thought to find something that he had done wrong in his job. Maybe he didn't keep his papers correctly. Maybe he, he, he fudged the books. Maybe he, he didn't show up on time. Maybe he was, he was late for meetings. Whatever it was, they sought to find fault with him concerning the job that he was doing. Daniel had an excellent spirit, and we see that that translated into his job. And therefore, he was able to show himself faithful, without error, and without fault at his secular workplace. We need to strive as Christians to have this testimony. We need to be Christians that, that when we go to our workplace, there's no fault found in our job. There's no fault found in our work and in our labors. All of the people beneath us, if we're in a position of power or authority, ought to have to really dig and really strive and really struggle to find even one iota of error or fault in us. But I believe if you have that good and right and excellent spirit in you and you let him do his work, it will show in your secular job. And, and they'll work as they might. They'll try as they can to find fault in you, but you shouldn't have any. There was no error. There was no fault found in this Daniel. Verse 5 said, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel. They, 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 they give up. They're like, what in the world? We cannot find any error in this man. So what they do? Except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And so they recognize very quickly that the law of God and the laws of the secular world, they have tendency to contradict. And he kept all of the laws of the secular world and of his job and of his workplace and showed himself to be faithful without error, without fault. 
So all they could do was muster in their minds and come up with a way to find fault with him concerning where they could find contradiction between the workplace and between the laws of his God. And so as it often is, men assembled together. The Bible says, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Daniel here with that excellent spirit in him was anointed of God in this circumstance. So it's no different. The same story rings through time where the heathen rage. These people imagine a vain thing. They set themselves to take counsel together against the anointed of God. Of course, by, by main application, that was Jesus being referred to in that song. But it's his anointed, nevertheless, are those with that good spirit within him. Now, he says, except we find it concerning him and the law of his God. And I believe that the day we live in, we're going to see more and more and more and more of this. Where suddenly the law of our God and the law of this world, they contradict. And men will even assemble themselves together and take counsel about how they can make more and more the law of God contradict the laws of this world. And so more and more Christians are going to be asked by the Lord to take a stand. Why? Because with our whole heart, soul, mind, strength, we ought to be seeking after the law of God. Nevertheless, trying as we may to do right by the secular world, the secular world is constantly kicking against the pricks, as it were, and trying to bring us into a situation where we have contradicted the law. And I think more and more we're going to start to see this happening. If you look in verse 6, they come to him, and then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. They come with that, that flattery. <laughs> live forever, King Darius. And immediately they, they bring their flattery and they couple it with a lie. They say all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors, the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree. And what was it? That anyone that asked petition of any god or any man other than that of the King Darius would be thrown into the den of lions. So this was the decree that they encouraged him. I believe by a little bit of flattery. I believe by a little bit of coursing. And also just by saying the statement that, hey, it's unanimous, king. You don't even have to think on this decision. All the presidents of the kingdom and everyone underneath them agree. I think if he thought about it even for a moment, he'd recognize that Daniel was one of the presidents and he was soon to be one over the president. Nevertheless, he didn't seek after Daniel in this matter. And it worked out. He convinced him, verse 7, Darius signed the writing and the decree. And it says in verse 8 that the law of the Medes and the Persians altereth not. In other words, once he signs it, that's it. It's law. It doesn't change. Verse 10, though, it says, Now when Daniel knew, I love this, when he knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Sometimes when a decree like that would come out, I think Christians will, when they know that it's been made, they'll just do as they're told. When they know that this decree's been made, they'll, they'll plead to Romans 13 and say, well, we should just obey our government, and if this is what he says, then I'm not going to pray for these, these days, and, and, and if I have any petition, I'll just take it to the king, no big deal. Sometimes Christians, when they know that these sorts of laws come at them, they'll, they'll just go into hiding, and they'll start meeting underground, and they'll start doing their prayers in their closet and hiding away. And I think... Sometimes Christians will, when they know that the writing was made, they'll even develop suddenly a prayer routine whereby they open their windows and they, and they pray before the world and, and, and three times a day, you know, they want everyone to hear them, right? Because sometimes people have the tendency that they want to rebel. <laughs> they have got a rebellious spirit. The government says, don't do this. And suddenly, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start this prayer routine that just kind of sticks it to the man. 
thing I love about Daniel is the thing that I want more in my life. That as I did a four time, change the laws. I'm going to stick to it. I'm be steadfast in these things, unmovable. As he did a four time, he kneeled. As he did a four time, he prayed. As he did a four time, he gave thanks. And this wasn't some new thing. I think the ones that came to the presidents that tried to um, undercut Daniel, take him out of the knees, the, the ones that tried to ruin him, the ones that tried to have him killed, they knew this too. They knew of Daniel that this was his manner. This is how he did things. A four time, the law comes, and this is the same routine that Daniel's going to go through. Now, what is your testimony a four time? When the government says you can't go to church, What is your testimony? What did you do aforetime? When the government tells you, you can't preach this Bible anymore in the streets, door to door in the houses. Well, what did you do aforetime? When the government says you must, you must take this mark to buy or sell. Well, what did you do aforetime, right? There's all different ways that we can see scripturally where the government could intervene in our lives. Well, what did you do aforetime? What I want to encourage all of us is to be steadfast through all of these things. Amen. As the world changes, we stay the same. As, as the laws change, we stay the same. Now, what was our testimony? Aforetime. Verse 11 said, These men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They knew he would be there, so they just came and found him doing exactly what they expected. I don't think Daniel opened his door because he wanted everyone to hear, because he wanted to shout it from the house. Steps, Look, everybody, I'm praying now. I think as some people might do once the writing is signed and once the law is changed and they say you can't do something, now they're going to get into the fight and they want people to see them doing it. But no, I think Daniel just opened the window, get some fresh air in there, so he could see where he's looking at Jerusalem. So, so he could he could he could see maybe birds going by. He could see nature. He could he could just behold heaven and think of the heaven of heavens beyond that, where his God was. Three times a day, that was just his routine. His his reset button was to get down on his knees and thank his God. Get down on his knees and pray supplications from his God. And I think he did this in the same way that he did his secular job. Faithful, without error, without fault, without boasting, without, without, without wanting something to glory of it. He simply gave it to God, that time and that manner. Now, where would the assembled men were men to come to you and to seek occasion against you and to try to trip you up concerning your laws, your, your God's laws and concerning the laws of men? Where would they find you? If that law were to change, would they find you before your God, seeking him three times a day? Would they find you before your God, asking supplication for him? Would they find you on YouTube watching silly videos? Would they find you uh, playing video games? Would they, would they find you reading, reading magazines? Would they find you entertaining yourself with, with sports? Daniel's manner was to seek after his God, and so it was the only thing that they could find occasion for him, was to go and say, hey... We know that this Daniel, that Daniel, he prays to his God. So the only way we're going to catch him is to make that illegal. Where would these assembled men in your lives, people that know you best, that are closest to you, in your circle, maybe they're against you, where would they find you if they were to try to trip you up, contradicting the world, world's laws and God's laws? Verse 12 says, Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree? They knew well that he had. That every man that shall ask a petition of any man or God within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And the king affirmed. Yep, that was true. This thing is true according to the laws of the Medes and Persians. And it alters not. It's funny, that statement, it alters not, okay? The laws of the Medes and Persians, it alters not. Once it's set, that's it. Worldly governments really think that, don't they? They think their laws are the laws above all laws. But we know within them there's inner contradictions. We know that it's a shifting sand. I mean, you could, you law, law, we, our law book is here, and it's pretty big, but we can at least hold it. Their law books fill, fill libraries upon libraries, and it's full of contradictions and errors and mistakes and, and uh, just 
you couldn't even imagine what the law books of your country look like. But they're a shifting sand and they change all the time, don't they? Every day they're putting a new bill, an addendum, an amendment to their laws. But nevertheless, the king thinks they establish and they're established and they, they alter not. We know the word of our God endureth forever. Amen. So what are you going to appeal to? The shifting sands? The contradictions, the errors, the, the amendments and addendums of this world's law or the law of God which has never changed. From the foundations of this world, the word of our God endureth forever. Verse 13, it says, Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. They come at him with this false accusation. Don't they always do that first? They tripped him up concerning the law, but they come and they say, He regardeth not thee, O king. You think Daniel didn't regard the king when he was about to be set up as the, the primo president, as the first among them? He was given all authority, or at least set to. And the king knew that had he that authority, the king would see no damage because Daniel was faithful and Daniel was... Um, without error and fault concerning his job there. Regardeth not thee, Daniel seemed to have the utmost respect for the king, re regarding him as the highest in his life aside from his God. I bet you when Daniel knelt and prayed, he even prayed for his king. And he even, he even, he even sought occasion to reach his king. And I think we see that a little bit later with the testimony that comes out of the king's mouth. He knew of Daniel's God. So Daniel did his best in his secular job. It was a strong testimony. He was also a strong witness of the God that he served. Yes, king, I serve my God above all, but hey, king, you are next in command. And yet they come and say, hey, he regardeth not thee, O king, nor that decree that thou hast signed, but make his petition three times a day. They said this as if Daniel had, again, changed his goalpost. At this moment, I think it occurred to the king, he's like, this is what he does every day. I know that he does this every day. Why did I write this command? And it comes to him. Then the king, when he heard these words, verse 14, was sore displeased, not with Daniel. He was sore displeased with himself. Yeah. Set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Daniel's excellent spirit testified of his worth to his master testified of his worth to his boss. His Lord had a high worth in his heart. His master, the king, the same thing. And so the king labors to deliver him. He set the law in ignorance, and he, he, he laments the fact that he did so to his beloved Daniel. He labors to deliver him. He, he stays up long into the night. The sun goes down, and he's still trying to figure out in his law books how he can let him get away with this, how he can let him free. Now, does your testimony among your bosses, among your authorities in your life, among your people that, your, your, your parents, does your testimony make you expendable or does it make you irreplaceable? Because I think the king had this impression. What have I done? Daniel's a friend. Daniel's a, an encouragement. Daniel's my best guy. He's my number one. He was the first. What have I done? He's irreplaceable. And now my law is going to have him destroyed by lions. Our testimony needs to be such where we're not expendable to this world, even the secular world. We are irreplaceable. We are something that they need at the workplace. They need down in, you know, in your family. They need you. Verse 15, it says, Then these men assembled unto the king and said, No, O king that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree or statute with the king established may be changed. They had to come in and coerce him and encourage him to do the deed. Follow your law, king. You even aren't above the law that you had made. The king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. And this is where I know that the king had conversations with Daniel about God. He, he, he knew of the God of Daniel. So he says this, The king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. <laughs> Again, my boss, I mean, I, I think to myself, do you think my boss would know that I serve my God continually? Do I serve my God continually? 
How often do I serve myself? How often do I serve my own flesh? How often do I serve my needs and my wants? How often do I serve my family? How often do I serve everything but my God? Yet the king recognized in his servant Daniel that he served God above all things continually. And he says, he will deliver thee. I don't know how many times Daniel had come into hard times and he looked stressed out and he looked worried maybe, or, or, or maybe the exact opposite. The king read on him, hey, you, I think you should be stressed in this scenario, but you're steadfast, you're immovable. He says, my God will deliver me. My God will deliver me. Maybe he was saying this testimony all the time. My God will deliver me. And the king then knew that Daniel's God was one that would deliver him. He's a great deliverer. Did Daniel testify previous of the great deliverer that is his God? I think he did. <clears throat> I think we need to do more of that in our personal lives, in our private lives, our public lives. Just testifying of the deliverer that is our God. So look what we have here. We have Daniel's excellent spirit on display. That spirit was in him, but he didn't let it just stay there. He didn't let it just, just, just be a blessing to him only. His spirit, the excellent spirit was in him, but it was seen on him. It was displayed. He was a light that shone forth. It was witnessed by all men that were around him. Let your good deeds so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's how your light should shine and that's how Daniel's excellent spirit that was within him was shown. Then, next, the worldly law came and it contradicted God's law. Now, we're taking some precautions, and obviously, if you're feeling sick, it's always been our rule, hasn't it? If, if you're feeling sick, stay home. And that's what I sent out in the text message. That's what I encouraged everybody who was able to reach. Hey, if you're feeling sick, go home. So they're starting to try to enact laws where public meeting, especially church meetings, and, and you see the sports stadiums, you see all these, these, these big events, they're trying to say, hey, no more of this. But our policy has always been, if you feel sick, stay home your distance right and so even if they were to say hey you cannot meet publicly well god's law is forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but so much the more as you see that day approaching right but we also have the policy that if you're sick stay home so if that law goes out don't meet we say god's law says i go to church but if i'm sick i'm going to stay home it's always been our policy as our manner was aforetime as we did aforetime we're going to continue doing those things this case, worldly law came, contradicted God's law. And what did Daniel do? Daniel did the same as he did aforetime. He was steadfast. He didn't change. He didn't budge. He just kept doing what he was, out of routine, he kept doing what he always did. Opened the door and prayed unto God three times a day. Even to the point where, when he was condemned in that thing that he always did, because the law had changed, because of his excellent spirit, and because it was something that he had always did, the king sought to defend his servant even against his own law that he had formed. But what we need as believers is that before testimony. I believe that we need to start now as we see on the horizon laws that blatantly contradict Christian laws, biblical laws. We need to prepare ourselves now to have a manner that is fitting with how we want to continue to live our lives afterwards. What I'm saying is that the first and third things that I mentioned, Daniel's excellent spirit and what Daniel did aforetime, if you don't have that, then you're not going to have any place for defense from the world when they come at you. I imagine for a, for a moment, you know, my manner was, was to pray and read my Bible in the morning, and then that became against the law. You can't pray and read your Bible in the morning. Okay, so I'm doing that. Somebody changes the law. Somebody shows up into my world and tries to condemn me in that thing. They would already know that I had done that. But at least I would have defense before my God and defense before them that I continued in the same thing. But I think some people are going to get, like I said, they are going to see the laws change and then start to develop their routine. And then start to seek after God. And then start to have a Christian cadence, if you will. That's the wrong order of things. Daniel had the excellent spirit. The worldly law came. Daniel did as he did aforetime. And Daniel was saved by his God. But first, his king even sought to save him in these things. It's kind of like this. If we're not enacting our rights now, then don't be surprised when they're taken away from you. If we're not meeting together now, 
then, then they can just remove whatever, whatever we think we have and it will be like nothing. I think all the time of these people that just sit home and they, they, they broadcast or they live stream their sermons while they sit in their living room. If they say you can't meet in church, that doesn't change anything from them. They can take away something from you because you never took advantage of the rights that you had to do those things, to meet together, to go to church. Christians just need to seek to guard our testimony. Do what's right now so that when the laws change, you can continue to do what's right and you can do it honestly and not appear as a hypocrite. The Bible says that the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. And I believe that, okay? So the preparation comes from forming your manner now. That's how you prepare yourself. That's how you're ready for when the tides of this world change. You already have a manner. Ultimately, safety is going to be of our God. And so, so whether or not the law changes and whether or not our king stands up to defend us because they'd seen our manner before time, it's ultimately of God that we're going to be protected. Verse 17 says, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. And the king went to his palace and passed through the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. And what you see here is that the king made a law which contradicted the law of God, and he did it unwillingly. He was tricked by those that were underneath him. He does this, and in the end, what happens as a result of the testimony of one man, Daniel, who chose to live a Christian life, whether the times change and the laws change and the seasons change, he's going to be steadfast in these things. What resulted is that in the end, God was able to prove himself faithful unto a great king. Because there was one faithful Daniel who lived before men and before his God honestly and sincerely and with the right spirit, with that excellent spirit, God was able to prove himself the deliverer of such an one. Daniel even was able to prove himself furthermore to be a faithful servant of his king. They said he doesn't regard you, king. And yet Daniel, when it opens up, when the, when the stone is rolled away, and the, his king cries out and says, Daniel, did your God deliver you? He says, O king, live forever. <laughs> and shows himself even after being betrayed by the king to be faithful unto his boss. And so the king's heart and the direction of an entire nation was changed. First justice was served. Look at verse 22. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth and they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. And he proved himself after this manner. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. That was the testimony of, of a man that was faithful in prayer and faithful in his workplace and faithful in his testimony was that when he believed on his God, even for the trouble that came, and even when the laws in our nation change against us, if we believe in our God, let it be known that God seeks these opportunities to glorify himself and to prove himself in order that even your testimony would be proved. Believe in your God and allow him to do great exploits in your life. And look what happens, verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell upon the earth. And this statement is amazing from a king that was an unbeliever. A king that was just, just a heathen king, a heathen lord over all these. Because of the testimony of one that did a great job at his workplace preached the gospel while he was there, that, that told of the living God while he was there, and said, he is my deliverer. It allowed for this king to make this decree. He says, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. 
His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, his dominion even shall be unto the end. I think the king saw first this steadfastness in Daniel. And that allowed for God to prove his steadfast in Daniel's life and allowed for Darius to see that. He says in verse 27, He delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this testimony actually shifted the entirety of a nation. Because one man decided to do as he did aforetime. Because one man decided that three times a day he would open up his windows and he would pray unto God. And that was just his manner. When the laws changed in opposition to that, he, he stayed steadfast, he stayed immovable, he kept doing what he had always done. And it allowed for this great testimony to come up before men so that the direction of a king's heart and the direction of an entire nation was affected by it to where a decree came out and said hey I know I made a decree that everyone should bow down and seek after me in these manners but no 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 I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men should be trembling and many should, men should fear before the God of Daniel because it's the God of Daniel that's able to deliver. It's the God of Daniel that's able to deliver and rescue. It's the God of Daniel that worked these great signs and wonders and saved his people and delivered his people and stuffed the mouths of lions and has shown himself strong through his spirit, through that man Daniel. Therefore, I completely change my mind. I repent. He's the God. He's the God. He's the God. Fear him. And what you see through this whole tale, through this whole uh, cap, uh, picture um, of Daniel's life, I love this, is that beginning to end, you see one man that continually did as he did aforetime, one man that is consistent. You don't want to be the person that when the law comes in and says, hey, you can't read your Bible, that suddenly you're like, okay, I'm going to read my Bible now. You, you want to be the person that had already been doing that. You don't want to be the one that when they say, hey, you can't preach in public, suddenly decides, all right, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to go soul winning. I mean, better late than never, but I believe it's the steadfastness of one believer that led to this tale being told and this event happening and this complete change in the direction of a king's heart and of a nation. It just comes off as hypocrisy. It comes off as blowheartedness. It comes off as, as a puffed up mentality that when, when the, the law changes, suddenly I'm going to break the law. <laughs> and you, and, and I, I mean, I can, I can think of ways that, that I've done that thing maybe, and I can think of ways that people might do that. You know, if they say, hey, you can't go to church anymore. Suddenly, all these people who are chest puffed up, I'm going to go to church anyways. It's, it's that rebellious spirit. But the ones that are steadfast, immovable, when the law changes and the sand shift, throughout beginning to end. As their manner was aforetime, so are they going to be after the laws change. Those are going to be the ones that cause for hearts of kings to change. So they would stand up and say, you know what? All people, nations, languages, kindreds, tongues, you need to understand that he is the God. He is the one that you need to fear. The God of Daniel. The God of Sound Words Baptist Church. The God of each and every one of you in here is the true God. He delivers. He rescues. And that's going to be the testimony that only comes because we have set ourselves to, as we did aforetime, so will we do now. And it starts with meeting together. And it starts with, you know, having common sense things. It starts with soul winning. It starts with getting out there and preaching to the lost. It starts with putting our stuff up on the internet. It starts with all the things that it, this church is known for. If the laws change, hey, they changed in opposition to us. We were never doing the opposite before. We can stay steadfast in those things, and God can use them, and I believe that. God wants consistency in the Christian life. Let's try to be consistent. Set yourself now. Decide what your manner is going to be. Continue in it. Commit to it. And stay faithful in that. Faithfulness, right? Perseverance. That, that, that comes because you set yourself so, and then everything's going to try to shift you from that, but you stay that way. It's the Christian life. Consistency. Consistency, not up and down. Back, I'm backslidden. I'm high in God. I'm backslidden. You know, it's just whew, consistently. It's a, it's a straight path that we need to follow after. Thank you, Father.